Hello, Rio. How's everybody doing? All right. All right, well, I'm excited to get to come and preach to us this morning, this morning, um, but in particular, because this passage, you know, we're doing this, this series where we're going back between Ecclesiastes, which leaves you totally dry and desperate and going, oh, <laughs> it's just this really dark, desperate stuff that says there's no meaning in life, and then we're flipping over to, we're flipping over to Philippians, there you go. For the second half of the message, and this week God got in my business. He got in my business because I'll tell you what, like, and and this is honest confession from a pastor. I have felt so discouraged and, and without realizing it. It's not like I was waving the white flag going, oh my goodness, I feel so discouraged. But I started finding myself just in a spiral I mean, how much more can this year throw at us? All the circumstances and pandemics and, and the news cycle and all the, the election. And I mean, you could throw a million different things and all of it just has people tearing one another apart. It's hard to look at the news. It's hard to know where you are. It's hard to walk through this without feeling discouraged. And this week, the passage, God got in my business and said, Sam, stop. You are victorious. You should go around with more victory and more joy regardless of the noise that's going around you. Than anyone else in this world, do you realize what you have, Sam? And so I want to start by talking about Ecclesiastes, but I'm going to give you a warning. We're going to go fast through Ecclesiastes because I want to land hard in Philippians. (laughs) Yes, amen. So here we go. We're starting in chapter 6. Ecclesiastes, just in case you haven't been with us through this series, Ecclesiastes is this thought experiment. Solomon's writing, and he puts these words in the mouth of a preacher, and he's kind of running a thought experiment, and he says, let's pretend that there's no God. Let's pretend there's no heaven. There's nothing beyond the sun. What would life be like? And he systematically and methodically goes through everything that we find our purpose and hope in in this life. And he just kicks the legs right out from underneath it and says it's meaningless. The literal word there, hevel, in the Hebrew means smoke. It's like you spend your whole life chasing, trying to grab it, trying to get a hold of it. And every time you open your hand to see what's there, it's empty, it's gone, it's meaningless. And he he begins to describe what this life is like. And I love, because Ecclesiastes paints this picture that's very much like an addiction. If you've ever walked through real addiction or addiction recovery, you know what this is like. But I'm going to tell you, if you have a pulse, you know what this is like. This is what it goes like. You find your treasure in money. Well, you get a little bit of it, and it'll give you a high. It'll make you think, oh, I've got it. This is good. Oh, I'm so exhilarated. i got to get more. Uh, Fame, reputation, applause. Oh, that really felt good. I want more and more. And then you get it, and you're like, well, that wasn't good as the last time. I need to up the dosage, and I need to up the dosage, and I need to up the dosage. And it's like a drug addict that's chasing around, and you never find enough to leave you permanently satisfied. Ugh. And so we get into this week's passage in Ecclesiastes, and buckle up because I don't want to stay here long. (laughs) If you want more on this, tune into the podcast. Selfless promotion, Mark and I, it'll be coming out this Thursday. So start in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and and what we want to know about this passage in particular is in ancient Hebrew culture, there were three things that a man was really considered blessed if he could get these three things, and it's wealth, it's many children, and it's long life. That kind of defined whether a man was really blessed. Wealth, many children, long life. So let's go through this passage because he's going to lay them all down and tell us what they win us. There's an evil that I have seen under the sun. Again, that means without God. There's an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. Man, it sure does. 
A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, and yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. Man, I can't tell you how many people I know who have all this stuff and they're slaving away for more. They never stop to enjoy it. You can't because the stress is on producing more or too much. You can't enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. He's going to die and all this goes to someone else. He's won nothing. It's done nothing for him. He's been slaving away for no prize. This is vanity, hevel, smoke. It is a grievous evil. There's your wealth. He goes on and he says, If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than him. Oof. All right, we're getting intense here. What's he saying? What does that mean? It means that if he's going around in his life and he's slaving away for the world's stuff and the world's prizes and everything that's there and he pays no attention to what's truly sacred because there's, there's two things. I just want to lay this down. There are two things in this world that have eternal consequences that we interact with regularly. God Your relationship with God has eternal consequences. You invest your life in him, it will go on forever. And the other thing, the other way you can invest your life that has eternal implications is people. Everyone that you're looking at in this room, everybody who's watching online is an immortal creature, C.S. Lewis says. You're going to live forever somewhere. And so whatever I can do to shape and to pour into your life has eternal consequences. What I do for my business, what I do for my bank account, cars, prestige, reputation, smoke. And if you're hearing this, you know that's true. You can't argue it. That's why when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandments are, what does he respond? You shall go make a lot of money. Nope. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because those are the two things you can do with your life that matter for eternity. Everything else. Now, you can do your business, and that's important if it's investing in people. Money is a wonderful thing if you're making it to invest in people, your family, your kids. Those aren't bad things, but if they're ultimate things, they're gross. They're smoke. And so he says, you know, he comes to the end of his life, and he has no burial. Why not? Because he spent his whole life slaving away after all these treasures that are going to disappear. And he has neglected the very people that would have honored him at his burial. So his burial is not important. And he says, man, if you live like that, if that's your life, a stillborn child is better off than that. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness. And darkness, its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over. So there we go. We had had money, we had wealth, then we had children. Now we're getting too long life. Even if he should live a thousand years twice over, doesn't that sound gross to you? Can you imagine living this for another 2,000 years? No thanks. Sorry. Am I the only one? Even though he should live a 1,000 years twice over, yet enjoy no good. Here's the deal. If he lives 2,000 years or he lives 10, everyone's going to the same place. Everything they've produced with their life, same destiny. And so then we skip to chapter 7. And he's basically saying, buckle up. (laughs) Don't set your hopes high is where where we're going to conclude. He says a good name is better than precious ointment. Well, what would you do with precious ointment in the ancient world? You'd use it to anoint people for office. Oh, you're a big deal. You're a king. A good name 
is way better than an office. That's going to be stripped away from you, no problem. He says, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. Ouch. In other words, at least at death you get, with there's no God, like there, at least there's some, some relief. Birth just launches you into this suffering. He says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind. This guy, this is not somebody you want to invite over for dinner parties. And he says, the living will lay it to heart. He says, sorrow is better than laughter. And now, like when I read that, I'm like, hold on a minute. Laughter is like one of the few things that I really love in this life. Like, I really love to laugh. So what do you mean sorrow is better than laughter? I'll take laughter any day. The Hebrew behind this is, is the word hatzak. It's where we get the name Isaac or Yitzhak. And it literally means like a victorious laughter. You know, like if you watch a movie and there's this really stunning ending where it's like this great triumph and you can't help but laugh at how joyful that triumph is? The word is also used in the Hebrew to mean disparage or to mock. It literally has this connotation of victory and loss. And what he's saying is sorrow is better than laughter. What does that mean? He's saying be pessimistic. Go into everything going, oh, this is going to be terrible. Oh, I'm bracing for sorrow. Don't laugh because I'm telling you, if you come optimistic, this world's going to wreck you. You're going to find again and again that it just destroys you and all of your hopes keep getting dashed. And everything that you think, man, this is going to be great. Oh, what happened? Sorrow is better than laughter. It's like don't get your hopes up, in other words. Lower your expectations for sadness of face, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. And what he means there is, you know, if you you set the bar low, at least you can exceed it and be excited about exceeding it. But don't be optimistic. You have no business being optimistic in this world without God, without heaven. It's just going to disappoint you at every turn. And so you go through history I'm not saying anything that the atheist or the agnostic doesn't have to wrestle with. This is the universal human condition. We all recognize it. We all recognize that we come up against this problem of pain and death and suffering. It's not a new problem. And in the history of the world, there have typically been two ways you come to say, all right, something's not right. What's the solution going to be? And the world usually comes with one of two solutions, and they're both bad. This is a line from C.S. Lewis. I want to read it, and then I'm going to explain it. He says, For the wise men of old, so the philosophers, the cardinal problem of human life was how to conform the soul to meet objective reality. The solution is always wisdom, self-discipline, virtue. For the modern... The cardinal problem is how to conform reality to the wishes of man. And so the solution is a technique. Let me me rephrase what he's saying. In the olden days, they said, something's wrong. Something's wrong with the world. It must be me. And so I've got to study and I've got to figure out how I can get wise enough to conform my life with the way that the world works so that I stop suffering. And so that's either going to become through self-discipline or it's going to come through wisdom. It's going to come through all these other virtues that if I just conform myself to the world, I'll have happiness. And what happens? Never works. You get the hardest working, wisest people. And they can live the most noble lives and they still come across pain and they still get swallowed up by death and they still suffer pandemics and they still get all these things that come and just rock them to their core. And then the other side of humanity says, I'm not the problem. The world's the problem. And so I'm going to produce a a medicine that fits my lifestyle. I'm not changing. I'm going to make society conform to my behavior and approve my behavior because the problem's not with me. It's with the world. It's with nature. It's with everything else. And so we've got to figure out a way to make the world meet me. Those are the two, and I mean, it shows up in just about every philosophy, every religion. One of those two extremes, one of those two paths 
for there. And here's the deal. Neither works. Why? Because Sam Kastensmith is desperately broken. It's not enough to work on Sam Kastensmith because Sam Kastensmith lives in a world that's desperately broken. We need a solution that comes not only promising to deliver us from the brokenness that we have and that we bring to the table. We need a solution that's coming to say, no, 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 I am going to make all things new. I'm going to transform you, Sam, and I'm going to transform the world that you live in. It's not about you. It's not about your world. It is about the Savior who promises to revolutionize and redeem both. And so just as a fun exercise to to lighten this, (laughs) this is something I did with my teachers that I find absolutely fascinating, and I may have shared this before in our spiritual formation night, But I want to show you what's happened with Disney. Because you see this wisdom show up in previous Disney movies. And so what I want you to see is if you go back into the past, Disney movies always focused on the need for some kind of radical transformation. Right? So you look at Beauty and the Beast, and the Beast needed to be... At the end of the movie, what happens? Oh, he becomes this adorable long-haired prince. Right? He's transformed into beauty. Or the Little Mermaid, what happens to her? At the end, she's transformed and she gets her legs so that she can live in the land where she's going to find happiness and love with the prince. Or Pinocchio, what's his story? What's his great hope? To be transformed to become the little boy. Back in the olden days, this was the heart of man. We knew we were broken. We knew that we needed to change. And so the movies, the stories to kids came and said, Something's off about you and you need to be transformed by love. And now you get to the other side and you see movies like Aladdin where it's like, just be who you are. The world needs to accept you. Or Frozen, the curse isn't taken away. The world just learns to live with you. Or Shrek, the ogre doesn't become the handsome prince. In fact, the princess becomes the ogre. And the world learns to love them as they are. And so here's the question. Which one is right and which one is wrong? They're both wrong. We run to one or the other. And here's the deal. Jesus comes to this side and he says, no, 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 no. You need transformation. It's a natural thing inside of you to know that there's something broken. There's something missing in me. I'm selfish. I got sin that I can't get rid of. It's in my nature. I need to be transformed. And yet, on the other side of that paradigm, it's absolutely a God-given instinct to want to be known and accepted as we are. For all of our flaws and all the ways that we don't measure up to what people want from us and demand from us. And Jesus comes and gives both He comes to me and says, Sam, I see you for the ogre you are. I'm going to transform you. I I see you as the ogre you are, and I know every detail about you. And I love you, and I accept you. You're mine, but I love you too much to leave you as you are. I'm going to redeem you and transform you, and one day you'll see me, and I won't be the scumbag standing in front of you right now. He's going to redeem me. And man, I cannot wait for that day. And so this world comes and says, how do we get joy? Is it it the stuff we chase? Is it the outside world? Is that what we need to go after? Or is it the inside? And now we pivot to Paul. (sighs) What does Paul have? Like we talk about, is it outside or is it inside? What's Paul going to say about his insides? <laughs> the chief of sinners. I want to stop sinning and I can't stop sinning. The things that I want to do right, I can't do. I'm a total train wreck. I'm a mess inside. Christ has redeemed me. He's made me righteous. He's clothed me in his righteousness. It's not about what's a mess in me anymore. And what about the outside? 
Paul's going to say the whole world is in bondage to decay. He's not putting his hope in the outside. Here you get, you get Solomon who's got it all, right? He's got all these treasures, all these blessings, all the knowledge, all the wisdom, everything. And here you have Paul, when he writes this letter, is sitting in jail. And he's lost his power, which he had. He lost his great wealth. He lost his fame. He lost his Roman citizenship as a criminal, essentially. Or at least it was downgraded. He had the best of educations. He had respect. And all of this, he's saying, I gladly lay it aside. In prison, worse circumstances than us today. Scars all over his body for what he found in Christ. And he opens this passage that we're jumping in today. In Philippians 1, starting in verse 18, I will rejoice. Say what? What do you have to rejoice about? Like, what in you do you have to rejoice about? What outside of you do you have to rejoice about? He says, I'll rejoice in this prison cell, for I know that through your prayers, And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Do you hear the confidence going on there? Do you hear the victory? He's in a prison. There's no signs of hope around him outside of the fact that he belongs to the Lord. And he's got saints out there that are praying for him. So I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Do you get that? Do you understand what he's saying there? I'm going to walk with joy here because if the worst that can happen, and I'm going to be delivered, like I am going to be delivered, whether by life or by death. What? No, 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 Paul. You don't seem to understand what deliverance means. Like deliverance means you get out of the prison. Your circumstance improved. God gives you a bunch of money maybe. Like, no. What's Paul's deliverance? Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. What does Paul see as his great deliverance from this suffering? That no matter what might come, Christ is going to be exalted through me in the midst of this, even if it brings death. That's my deliverance. That's what I can live for. That's what I can take another breath for because he's worth it. In the Christian church, I just want to say this, we treat, we treat the resurrection like it's a consolation prize. Like, oh man, what, what if Paul died, I mean, the resurrection, I mean, we think of it, well, you know, at least Jesus will bring us back to this. No. No, no, no. The resurrection is not the consolation prize for the Christian, it's the purpose God is not going to bring us back to this. He's going to deliver us from this. On the morning of the resurrection, when we stand glorified, being made like Christ, radiant, sharing in his glory, it says, we not only walk out with all of this fixed, but with all of this fixed. And that's his guarantee. We have that sealed, guys. We should walk around with confidence. We shouldn't be wincing at every turn. You know, I want to give you an illustration. I want you to imagine that I I, I grabbed you and I said, okay, I want you to run into a brick wall. Right? You'd say, Sam, you're crazy. I'm not running into a brick wall. I said, you got to trust me. Just run into the brick wall. You're carrying all your your treasured possessions. You got everything. You know, you got maybe have your little ones with you, whatever. I want you to run as fast as you can into that brick wall. If I believed what the preacher in Ecclesiastes is saying, that there's nothing beyond the sun, 
And that brick wall represents death. How am I going to run at it? I'm going to be terrified. I'm going to be wincing. I'm going to be cowering. I'm going to change everything that I'm doing. I'm going to be worried about how it's going to hurt. I'm going to be worried about my bones breaking. I'm going to be worried about my possessions. But what if I told you guys, that is not a brick wall. The Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection has transformed that for you into a razor-thin paper mache and when you run through it and you collide with it, it's not even, you, you'll, you won't even feel it. Now run. You run differently, won't you? Do you believe that? Do you live with the hourglass going down, believing that that really is a brick wall? Or do you believe that Jesus has transformed that to not the end, but the beginning of something glorious? Because if you believe that, it changes the way you run, doesn't it? Doesn't it free you up to run with abandon, to run with all, you know, just passion? I'm all in here. And here's my favorite verse in this passage. It says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh, to die is gain. That is so true. If the worst comes, it is gain. And so then this begs the question. So are we just supposed to sit around in this dumpster fire (laughs) waiting for death and that's our good news? No. Remember the brick wall? If you believe that Jesus has overcome the brick wall and he's transfixed that to something that doesn't hurt you, but you can run right through it. Guess what? You're free to really run on this side of the grave. You don't have to have a timeline. You don't have to have all the pressures. You're not trying to store it all up. Now you can really run. C.S. Lewis said this. I love this, and it's absolutely true. You've ever heard that expression, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That's garbage. C.S. Lewis says this, if you read history, you'll find that Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians, hear me, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world with all of its glory and peace and presence of Jesus. And man, what I wouldn't give for some of that to come down here. It's largely since Christians have ceased to think of the other world, that they have become so ineffective in this one. I want you to think through history. The greatest impact of people in this world, the disciples obsessed with the resurrection, transformed the world. The great minds of the Middle Ages, fixed on Christ, transformed the world. The great abolitionists in Europe, And America had their eyes fixed on heaven, not here. And they changed the world. The brightest lights of the civil rights movement had their eyes fixed on heaven, not here. They saw the beauty of heaven and thought, man, can we bring that down? And so C.S. Lewis says something that's at the heart of Ecclesiastes. He says, you aim at heaven... You get the earth thrown in. You aim at earth, you'll get neither. Aim at heaven, you get the earth thrown in. You aim at earth and you will get neither. And we have horrible, guilty parties standing in front of you right now. We have horrible horrible eschatology, an understanding of what's to come. That's what that word means. And this is why, if I have no hope of heaven, if I have no hope of freedom, if I have no hope of deliverance, guess what? If this world is all there is, and I only have whatever, probably for me it's a lot less time, but if I only have 70, 80, 90 years to find my utopia here, and I see people getting in the way of my vision for utopia, what I want to come out of the world... I am going to rage or I'm not going to be able to get out of bed in the morning. If 
my eyes are fixed here, if this is all there is, this kingdom will control me like a puppet. And I'll be entirely ineffective to truly win this nation for Christ's sake. I have to ask myself, like, Sam, do you get more passionate about what you see happening in this kingdom or about what you want for that kingdom? Guilty. Depending on the day. Boy, I can get fired up watching the news. I can make all my emotions. I can get all contorted about all the insanity that I see and the lawlessness and the, and the chaos and the hatred and, and the political jockeying and how nasty this world has become. And I owe it to my Savior to say that kingdom will not own me. Your kingdom will. And so what does that mean? Well, let's think about the other half of this verse. Yeah, for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain, and I'm all about the dying. Give me, give me into that kingdom. That sounds really nice, doesn't it? But listen to the other half of what Paul says. For to me to live is Christ. You almost want to fix his grammar, don't you? The sentence kind of sounds weird. For to me to live is Christ. You want to say, hold on, Paul, let me, let me help you here. What you mean to say For to me, to live is for Christ or with Christ, by Christ, in Christ. Get what Paul's saying, because he's not saying those things. He's saying, for to me, in this prison, suffering, to live is Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, I want to be empty. I want to get out of the way. I want you to engineer my life. I want you to steer it. I want you to take control. This is not a Sam enhancement project. This is a Sam replacement project. Because guess what? If you ask my wife if she prefers Sam's love or Sam animated by Christ's love, guess what she's going to answer? You want to know my employees or people I work with or my brothers or my mom or my dad, who they would rather be around, Sam or Sam animated by Christ? Guess who they're going to answer, which one they want. It's not hard to believe, is it? Paul's not saying for me to live as for, by, in Christ. He's saying, I, I want you to take over your mission, way more, way more beautiful than mine. Your impact, your power, your ability, your resurrection. Like, I want that infused through me. Take me over. Fill me up. Live in me. And he's going to say that in Galatians, right? For I have been crucified with Christ that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This doesn't mean, and this is probably one of the more beautiful parts of this. Because God's not saying, hey, Sam, get out of the way. What God is saying is, Sam, I have uniquely made you. I've made you with all these characteristics. I've made you with these talents. I've made you with all of these things that I can uniquely reach the world if only you'll let me operate and animate you. You don't lose your individuality in this deal. You finally find it. For the first time ever, when you step aside and you let the Lord come in and work through you, it's the first time that you will live and feel the beauty of the way that God has designed you. It's like like a mosaic stained glass window. It's nice, but man, when the light shines through it then it's beautiful. We should be the most triumphant people in this world. The inside transformed. The world transformed. It's done, guys. We are going to that land. That is our home, and we are on the way. 
all things, all mourning, all death, all pain done away with. Perfect presence with God without sin. No broken relationships anymore. All the things that make it hard to get out of bed in this kingdom. Our home rids all of that. And our hearts in this process now of salvation that are already starting to become like Jesus on the morning of the resurrection, you will be radiant. So Christians, do not let this world tell you that you are defeated. It's not about you. The Lord Jesus Christ has overcome And he has given you his victory. And now he calls you to walk in that victory. To walk in that joy. And let the rest of the world that are like this preacher in Ecclesiastes trying to figure out where can I find any hope. Let them see the joy and strength that Christ shines through you when you really decide, you know what? To die is gain. But if I'm going to live, take over, Lord. And live through me. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your hope. Man, I can't imagine how people who don't have that kind of hope operate in this world, how they do get out of bed. It'd be just like this, this preacher in Ecclesiastes that just says it's all meaningless, it's all smoke. But in you, the smoke becomes substance. We grab hold and you promise to make all things new in us You make all things new. You rid us of our shame. You rid us of our sin. You make us new. And you call us on this journey toward our homeland where you will take all the broken, fallen, hurtful things and you will make all them new. And so, Father, give us that kind of joy to know what you have accomplished for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.